Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, we are starting um, our next lab seminar. This time we have with us uh, Fotis Schulmans. Let me put the camera right on her so you can see her, Fotis. Fotis, uh, Fotis is a researcher at CLA and she will be speaking today about uh, the book called The Method of the La method, is, is it, the method. Yeah, is it one book or like, you know, like many, many volumes? So like you will explain this yes, uh, by Edgar Morin. So, what is the floor is yours? So, the method is six volumes big. Uh, just, a, just a moment, because people say uh, that if they are supposed to hear us, they don't. Uh, 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 is, uh, is it true for everybody online that you don't hear us? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Not. Yeah, yeah, okay, don't don't count, count this as, as a valid question. Uh, yeah, just a moment, just a moment. Uh, because this is a very sophisticated microphone, this is why it probably... Hello, everybody online, can you hear us now? No. Yes, okay, but, but before you didn't, yes? I don't know. Okay, but they say they... Uh, I am hearing. Sounds was um okay, so I'm I'm not sure if the introduction was heard by, by everybody, but we could like okay, if if not, I will add it to the recording later. <laughs> okay. So we are uh, yeah, back back to the moment where, where Fotis is starting her talk. So um I read the 2500 pages uh of uh, the method of Edgar Morin, uh, which are comprised in six volumes, and it has been written from 1977 until 2004. And I must say that, in my opinion, it's it's getting more and more pamphleteering when you get further in time, and it's because it's been written for over such a long period of time, uh, it's quite repetitive because I think he is afraid people forgot what they read before. Um, it's not very easy to do it in English because Morin is inventing words. So, but for instance, he invents reliance which means something completely different in English than it does in French. Um, and he invents quite a bit of words. So sometimes I have had to think of quite a bit to figure out how to translate it. But Morin states he's not abusing of neologisms, but is activating words which before were passive. So what I have done, because it's a huge amount of uh, text, uh, I have made an overview of the main concepts chronologically. So following the books, uh, and I've selected three out of more, uh, many more questions, which I will propose for discussion. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is that I will go through to the six volumes. The first one. Uh, yes, yes, I see when you are changing your question. The, the nature of nature, which is questioning the uh, prevalent scientific approach. It concerns mainly the physical world and is outlaying really the basic concepts. Um, and he starts from the statement that the current mainstream scientific thinking, which is materialism and or de determinism, excludes the observer uh, and the subject and disorder. Uh, and uh, since it proceeds through simplification and disjunction, we need a new paradigm which associates primary concepts in a recursive loop and which takes into consideration anti antagonisms and uncertainty. The second book is the, uh, called The Life of Life, and it's about understanding life. It deals with biology, ecology, which he calls oikos, and individuality. And he, uh, he identifies three types of individuality, cells, multicellular beings, and societies. Um, the third volume is The Knowledge of Knowledge, and deals with the origin of life. And to be able to make so, so choices we need knowledge. We are, and he states we are facing a crisis concerning the principles and structures of knowledge. He thinks we are in the prehistory of mind, and we need conscious complexity. So it's an epistemological, epistemological uh, issue. Um, then the fourth one is about the ideas, the noosphere, and the knowledge. Um, and he there considers knowledge from the collective and societal point of view. Uh, and life of ideas is, is knowledge. 
and he also goes into paradigmology. Um, then the before last uh, volume is the humanity of humanity, the human trinity. Uh, for those concepts, all the concepts will be explained later on. It's just an overview. Uh, so there he states that what unites us separates us and that uh, diversity should not mask the fundamental unity of humanity, nor the other way around. And then uh, the last one is called ethic um, and is about relinking, which is the word I used to uh, translate reliance. Um, what is needed is a metamorphosis, an awakening and activation of generative and regenerative powers, which become creative powers, and the emphasis is laid on solidarity. So the first concept, I, I just wanted to mention also that I ran my presentation with Edgar Morin and he was impressed. Uh, oh. So... Um, is he alive? Yes, he's on 101. It's one hundred and one. Yes. Yes, he even proposed to come. I told him that maybe for a small thing like this, it was not very useful. <laughs> so you have a full I, authorization. I, I, I met him. Uh, well, no, I, I was at the conference where he spoke two two weeks ago in Marrakesh, and I saw his presentation. So at hundred and one, he's the oldest speaker I've ever seen at the conference. He was probably listen. Will probably listen to us on YouTube. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I saw him also, but ten years ago, also in yeah. the conference, yeah. he was okay. giving the, the. No, but it was very nice that uh -huh. he. Yeah. I just sent it to him and I asked him, "What do you think about it?" So he didn't have to do it. Nice. <laughs> okay. So we'll start with the recursive loop. So it's a basic notion to understand the processes of auto-organization and auto-production, and thus of complexity. It transcends the linear cause-effect conception, since effects retroact on causes and themselves produce what is being produced. It's a bit like bootstrap, I think. Um, and then the second uh, concept is organization. It's a tetralogic loop combining order, disorder, organization, two interactions. This one you have to leave because all the oranges. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, these different terms cannot be separated. They are at the same time complementary, competing and, uh, and antagonist. So I'll explain each of the... Mm -hmm. Terms. So disorder starts from entropy. Uh, well, we know that when entropy increases, disorder increases. And it encompasses agitations, dispersions, turbulences, collisions, irregularities, instabilities, accidents, risks, noises, mistakes in every domain of nature and society. And it's generative and degenerative. The in disorder, there is disorder, and there are our orders in disorders. And there cannot be any order without disorder. And that reminded me of Prigorin's idea of order out of disorder. Then order encompasses regularities, stabilities, constants, repetitions, invariances, and classic de determinism and determinations. It emerges from the boundary conditions, which are specific to the formation of our universe, from randomness and restrict, restricts the field of possibilities in developing local and conditional necessities and probabilities. It's not absolute nor universal, but relative, relational, and interdependent. The dialogic of order and disorder produces organization. Then for Morin, organization is the marvel of the physical world, which consists of atoms, molecules, stars, life, and society. And we must keep in mind that organization is not reversed disorganization. Once generated, organization and its order can resist a large number of disorders. For example, scrambled eggs cannot be unscrambled. And the organizational principle arises in and from catastrophe, that is, change of form. And the example Mora gives is the origin of our universe. So organization is a disposition of relations between components or individuals producing a complex unity or system with emergent qualities out of random encounters. 
and then we have interaction. Uh, these are reciprocal actions which modify the behavior of nature or, or nature of elements, bodies, objects, phenomena, present or influenced. What are, is required for interactions are obviously elements, beings or material objects which can meet, meeting conditions, turmoil, turbulence, counterflow and such things. Um, what is also required is to obey to determinations and constraints depending on the nature of the meeting elements, objects or beings, and those interactions can become interrelations. Um, so interrelations refer to the, it refers to the kind of and forms of links, associations, relations, combinations, communication between elements or individuals, between elements and uh, or individuals and the whole. So interrelations with some stability or regularity become organizational and produce a system, but there is no sui generis or organizational principle. They can go from associations when the constituting elements conserve much of their individuality to combinations when the whole is more unified. And they can come about on uh, several ways uh, by fixed and rigid, rigid, rigid dependencies, uh, through active or organizational interrelations, through regulatory retroactions and informational communications. So a system is an organized object which can only be explained by its components and its organizational and systematic nature, which transform the characteristics of its components. It is a complex unit with qualities, qualities which are unknown at the level of its components. It's a whole which through organization, which is called solidarity and sol and with through the solid solidarity and solidity of the interrelations, obtains a certain du du duration despite random perturbations. So actually it's an emergent whole. So emergence, um, it's other properties or qualities arising from the organization of diverse elements or constituents associated in a whole. It's a whole since the whole is emergent and emergence is a characteristic of the whole. It's not deductible from the qualities or properties of these elements and cannot be reduced to their constituents. Links, quali it links qualities Properties, production, novelty, and globality. It's an irreducible event. It cannot be decomposed nor deducted. It's not an it's not an epiphenomena nor a superstructure, but has superior qualities, which are prompted by organizational complexity. And it's too much linked to the whole, which is too linked to the organization, to be rendered superficial. It can retroact on the whole on the constituents bestowing them with qualities of the whole. It's another type of system of, globals, of a global state with new or emergent quality, qualities with a new nature. For example, matter at the atomic level, life which emanates from vital organization, meaning which uh, stems from the emergence of discourse and humanity from the hyper complex brain. So in fact, an emergence is a logical jump. Uh, then a, a term very often used also is dialogic, uh, which is the complex unity between two complementary antagonist and rival logis, logics, entities or instances, instances which feed, complete each other, but also resist and fight each other. So they give rise to uncertain, uncertainty, and it's uncertainty which fosters the development of intel, intelligence. So the, the antagonisms persist and are constituent of complex phenomena, which is contrary to Hegelian, Hegelian dialectics, where they are dissolved at a superior, superior level. And we come to the next concept, which is dependent autonomy. autonomy. So autonomy is to follow, follow your proper law. And the autonomy of living beings emerges from their continuous activity of auto-production and auto-organization. 
Living beings have unceasingly to nourish themselves with external energy, matter, and information in order to re regenerate, thus they are dependent. And they are part of an ecological community through and according to their existential need of other li lives. And they nu nurture their existence and nurture their eco ecological community with life and death. Autoproduction through physical interactions and encounters, and then therefore eco organizing reproduction cycles. So, auto, auto, auto organization is dependent on the eco, or eco organization and is a part of it. <coughs> so, eco organization is co organizing, co cooperative, co programming the phenomena of auto organization from order, disorder, and the unknown. The ecosystem produces organized complexity, which feeds the auto organizations. With produ which produce organized complexity, which feeds the ecosystems. So it's really a loop. Uh, the more a being becomes autonomous, autonomous, the more complex it becomes. The more this complexity depends on the eco organization of the complexity which feeds it. So it's all it's freedom and dependence at the same time. Then we get to ecology of action. Um, because of the multiple and complex inter and re interactions and reactions in the environment where actions take place, once triggered, ego egoist or not or not egoist action often escapes the control of the actor and brings about unexpected effects and sometimes even contrary ones to those expected. Action does not only depend on the actor's intentions, but also on the conditions of the environment in which it takes place. And so the long-term effects of an action are unpredictable, unpredictable, which means that the maximal level of efficiency of an action is situated at the start of its development. And Moret wants us to steer away from manichaeist pseudo-ethics, where good and evil are the fundamental principle and with, they are both equal and antagonist. It, would, would, it, it should allow us to conceive of the huge risks associated with action, which can be found back by with, uh, Hannah Arendt also, when she deals uh, with uh, the human character and uncertain, uncertainty. And the stand, central problem of action is the strategy you will adopt. Um, so we have all, I've already spoken about the uh, Generative and generativity, um, which is defined as the difference, uh, which differentiates living auto organization, organizations from artificial machines, since they can auto generate, auto regenerate, and auto repair. Um, they are based on uh, uh, on an organizational program of genetic inheritance, and genetic in inheritance is virtual potential. It's past, and it may become future. Which, and it transfers life and the possibility to live by oneself, which is actualized in the phenotype. Uh, and the phenotype is present, because it's what we can see. Um, it's actual, it's, Im it's immediate, uh, and it's existent. Um, the phenotype, which are the observ observable characteristics of an organism, are the result of the interactions between genes and the environment is the sphere of organizational autonomy, um, and of the emergence of being an individual existence. So again, we have a, a reverse of um, Physical generativity, uh, beings organizing themselves, is always spontaneous, to, and it does not have an informational, informational program to control or program it. The phenotype is not only the expression of the gen genotype, but also entails marks of environmental constraints, constraints and stimuli. The dependence on, on the genes produces organizational autonomy with regards to the environment. The dependence on the environment not only feeds this organizational autonomy, but also ensures, ensures the existential autonomy of being from the genes. It actually ensures individual existence. 
cells, which are the smallest individual beings, are computing devices, which become generative by transform transforming information into programs and strategies, which govern phenomenal actions and performances, which being necessary for the existence of the generative device, participate in the regeneration of the generator. Now we get to computation, um, which is general so problem solving with a cognitive dim dimension. So information is whatever for an observer or a recipient in a situation where two instances are possible, settles an uncertain uncertainty or solves an alternative. It, so it replaces uncertain uncertainty certainty by certainty. The sign or symbol is how the information is coded in, in patterns, in, in organized forms. The memory uh, is used based on its needs and necessi necessities, and it will, you being used is either to extract it, to inscript, to duplicate, to modify, or to erase. And the software are the principles, the rules, and instructions which govern and control the calculations, perceptive operations, and reasonings. So computation can be transposed from computers to all living beings. It is at the same time organizing, producing, behavioral, and cognitive. It allows survival and reproduction, and it is egocentric, but it's not closed. For instance, uh, bacteria communicate with each other through DNA. Um, it produces and or maintains the identity of being, which is not transcendent or nor absolute, but individual and generic. For instance, uh, the DNA, DNA virus in a cell will reproduce, but at some level uh, it will uh, produce its own death. Um, the computer uh re, re, regenerated through auto organization organization regenerates it and simultaneously exerts its cognitive action on the external world living as a process is a process of cognition this comes from maturana which is cited quite often by moran and uh, all knowledge therefore is subjective which is fun a fundamental act of placing oneself at the center of the world. Then we come to the holographic principle. Um, and that was very peculiar because I just read on the origin of time from Thomas Hertog and Stephen Hawking. And actually Hawking's last the, the theory is holographic cosmology. Uh, so it was, Peculiar to have twice the hologram at the center of a tear. Uh, so the hologramic principle is, uh, well, the hologram is an image where each point includes almost all information on the depicted object. It is the whole, it's, the whole is some way included in all the singular parts which are included in the whole. So the parts are also virtual micro holes. The parts can be singular or original, whilst possessing the general and generic characteristics of the whole. The parts can have relative autonomy and the parts can establish communication between them and perform organizing exchanges. And they can potentially be able to re regenerate the whole. Shall I in briefly explain what the holographic cosmology of Hawkins and uh, uh, Hertog is? So they start, they, they think it's a three-dimensional shadow, shadow world of quantum particles and quantum fields projecting the past. So what we see, what, what exists is the past. Uh, and if we manage to decode this they claim, we would in the understand uh, the uh, core of physical reality. And the, the holograph holographic principle for them is more basic than time. Uh, of which the uh, expand uh, and the, the expanding universe is the result of this hologram gramic principle in that form of um, So for Morin, the hologramic principle uh, is the key principle uh, of polycellular veg vegetal and animal organization, 
uh, within the living universe. And he gives some uh, examples. Each cell, cell contains the genetic code of the whole being. Each cell remains singular because it's controlled by the organization of the whole, which is produced by the interaction of the cells. And only a small part of the genetic code is expressed in each cell. However, the virtual whole remains present and could be actualized if, for instance, if we would be cloning from one cell. Um, then we come to the IDs, uh, the no-sphere, so that it concerns the life of IDs, minds, gods, entities, which are produced and fueled by human minds within their culture. Well, as we all know, it's a, a term coined by Taylor de Chardin. Um, these entities are endowed with dependent uh, autonomy, and they are dependent on minds and the culture with which fuels them uh, and acquire an own life and a dominating power on humans. It's, it's subjected to the continuous dialogic to, between order, disorder, and organization. And so they are born, develop, transform, and die. When humans take their ideas for reality, they tend to believe the nosphere is the world itself. That concerns their subjecti subjectivity. There are the ideas about the world and then placing themselves at the center of the world. And all of this then becomes the world. The no nosphere gives rise to human inquiry and thus to knowledge. And it makes contact with the unknown, the inexpressible with mystery. Um, and then there, there I too thought that uh, this could be a means to reinvent the sacred as suggested by Stuart Kaufman. Um, the nosphere is a transforming and transfiguring, di transfiguring duplication of reality, which is superimposed on reality and appears to conflate with it. It embraces humans whilst being part of them, being dependent on human minds and culture, it emerges autonomously in and from this dependence. And when a deviant tendency is victorious in an open dia di dialogic, it can impose a new normalization and thus become a new paradigm, which leads us fluently to paradigm. So uh, a paradigm contains for each discourse uttered utter thereunder the fundamental concepts or the main categories of comprehensibility, as well as the kind of logical re relations of attraction, attraction and or repulsion between these categories, conjunction, disjunction, implications, and so forth. Semant semantically, uh, paradigm determines comprehensibility and gives meaning. Logically, it determines the main logical operations. Ideologically, it's the first principle of association, elimination, selection, which determines the conditions of organization of ideas. It orients, prescribes, controls the organization of individual reasoning and the systems of ideas which fall under it. So what are the characteristics of the paradigm? They cannot be falsified, uh, but the scientific theories it contains can be fals falsified. It has axiomatic authority, it's the base for the axioms which retroactively le legitimize it. It excludes not only non-conformed data, formulations and IDs, but also problems it does not recognize, the problems it does not recognize. It blinds since it excludes, it's invisible, it's part of the un unconscious higher consciousness. It generates evidence through self-concealing, it co-generates a feeling of reality, it's foolproof since it's invisible, except for those not adhering to it. Um, between different paradigms, paradigms, there is an incomprehension and antimony. It's recursively linked to the discourses and systems it gen generates. It determines a mindscape through theories and ideologies, and it cannot be contested, attacked, or destroyed directly since it's invisible and foolproof. Very nice. Uh, now we get to the Trinity brain mind culture. Uh, mind, to Morin, emerges uh, from the human brain with and through language. And language opens us to the world, but also separates us from it. Um, 
uh, and obviously it's always set in a specific culture. Once mind has emerged, it retracts on the functioning of the brain and on the culture. And because of the size of, the, of our brain, which allows for new forms of autonomy, strategy, intelligence, and behavior, as well practically, technically, as theoretically. In the mind, intelligence, thought, conscience, individual language, individual language, culture, and society are associated. It's an innovation in the evolution of humanization and groundbreaking in human evolution. Genetic reorganization is no longer genetic reorganization no longer innovates, but mind's capabilities and ingenuity do. And mind allows for consciousness. Um, which made me think of uh, Daniel Dennett's uh, user illusion uh, combined with the paradigmology of and the new sphere, uh, and also the difference between competence and uh, comprehension, Daniel Dennett underlines. <coughs> the human trinity is uh, the base of human complexity. It uh, comprises it comprises the individual, society, and, and the species. Um, and individuals are the result of the reproductive process of the human species, which is produced by individuals. Uh, interactions between individuals produce society, which retracts on them through its culture and allows them to become human. They generate and regenerate each other, and each of the terms is a means and a goal. Their relation is dialogic and thus can become antagonistic. Every human behavior, mental activity, praxis is par partly genetic, partly brain activity, partly mental, partly subjective, partly cultural, and partly social. And the human common identity is generic. It's regenerating, regenerating, and hereditary. Um, and it's uh, with the uh, um, the human identity is cer cerebral. It's the ability uh, to speak, to the fact that we are all equal before that. That um, culturally, sociologically, we are all, it's a generic identity, although it's extremely diverse. So it can be con considered a multiple unity. Um, then we get to Quadrimoteur. Uh, the, the, that, that's the motor of the planetary economic mega in, engine. Uh, it's the alliance of science, technology, industry, and capitalism, or profit, which since the 20th century drives the making of history, as by, whereas previously it was more techni technical techniques which were developed by society and which developed societies. Um, history destroys as much as it assimilates, each development comes with disorganization and degradation of what was before. For example, the development of the West uh, was, uh, went along with subjugation and colonialization. And we can now see that the techno-economic progress leads to global warming. So it's again uh, a dialogue between uh, anti antigens. Um, it accelerates and amplifies processes through positive feedback which development can no longer be regulated and leads to catastrophic or unpredictable transformations, which is log logical further to the action ecology. Um, this planetary mega machine, however, uh, has no central apparatus. What counts is what is quantifiable, what is manageable uh, in developed societies, um, technical innov innovation, the rationality of the market. Which we all consider, which should consider, which are all considered as progress. And what Mara calls for is a global commons, including water and information, and the integration of nations in a planetary community. And he wants a, a metamorphosis, actually, but he wonders whether we will be able to inhibit barbary and whether we will be able to really civilize humans. And then we come to the theme of the last book, Relinking, which is Reliance in French, a term coined by the Belgian sociologist Marcel Bolle de Bal, uh, who uh, was a professor at the ULB of sociology. 
Uh, and here I wanted to activate the word relier, which in English is to link. Uh, to link is passive, connecting is participating, and then relinking or the French reliance is active. Um, and every view on et ethics has to notice that the moral act is an individual act of relinking, relinking with another, with a community, with a society, and ultimately, ultimately with the human species. The complexer society is, the less constraints for individuals and groups, whereby its social link is weakened. At the extreme, compl complexity dissolves in disorder. A high level of complexity can only be protected through solidar solidarity between inter being interiorized by all members of a society. And societies are not able to impose their ethical norms to everybody, and individuals have to overcome their egoisms to behave ethically, which in a very complex society become, becomes an acute problem since traditional solidarity breaks up through individualism. So there is a link between solidarity, complexity, and freedom. And a complex society cannot maintain its cohesion only through just laws, but also needs responsibility and solidarity, solidarity intelligence, initiative, awareness from its, for, from its citizens. So actually what he asks for are auto-ethics. Ecology of action has to be taken into consideration. There is always uncertainty in the relation, intention, action, and the conditions of the environment in which they take place are also influencing the effects of an action. So to Morin, ethics is relinking and relinking, relinking is ethics. And then there is a very peculiar fact in uh, the whole uh, method. Um, that is that complexity is never defined. Um, I think it's uh, on purpose a transcendental concept that he, that he didn't want to define it because he thinks it's unde undefinable. Uh, it's something which is above our heads. Um, but he does make the difference between anthroposocial law and high complexity. And it's my understanding that the high complexity is what he understands under what we usually call complexity. So the, uh, in the left column, you have the characteristics of low complexity, complexity and in the right one, high complexity. So to Morin, uh, a low complex uh, society is uh, highly centralized and a highly complex, on the contrary, is polycentrist and decentralized. Um, in the low one, you have a strong hierarchy. In the high one, you don't have a strong hierarchy. It's more polyarchy, hierarchy, and anarchy. Um, in the one, you have coercion. In the other, in the other freedom. Um, in the low complex society, there is low individual autonomy, which on the other hand is high. Um, in, there is little communication and interaction between groups and individuals in a uh, low complex uh, society and there is multiple communication and interactions between groups and individuals in the other. Um, there is under specialization and a strong specialization in a low complex society and in the high complex society there are specializations and polycompetences. In the low one you have repression of disorder of noise and in the high one we have tolerance for disorder uh, deviance and non-conformism. Um, in the low one, there is dogma and faith. In the high, there is only doubts and questions, uh, which leads eventually to stability in the low complex society and little evolutionary possibilities and instability in the high complex one uh, with many evolutionary possibilities. Um, and this is, I think, the uh, base of uh, his of Moraes thinking uh, in in the, the, the method. It's really the starting point. That's, but I don't think he wants to pin himself on to some definition. And that's the end of the presentation. Now I have my questions. And obviously, you can ask questions too. Is there so a, the, a the slide with complexity continues. It's uh, it's this one. Okay, there's a, there's a, it's, uh,
Ah, yes, I forgot. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, the only way more uh, just give some sort of an uh, of a definition of uh, complexity is about complex thinking. And to him, that's the journey looking for a way of thinking which would respect multidimensionality, the world, the mystery of reality, knowing the cerebral, cultural, social, historical, social historical determinations, which every thinking is subject to and always could determine the object of knowledge. Good, it's a bit vague. Yeah, I have two questions actually, one and a half questions. Uh, the first one is maybe personal. What made you invest the uh, life energy and time to read two thousand two and a half thousand pages of well I've already read uh, Whitehead, I've read uh, Bergson, I have uh, read uh, uh, Apostle, I have read um uh, Kaufman, and so I was thinking like I want to write write a PhD on being and becoming. So to be complete, I thought I had to read Edgar Morin also. <laughs> and, and out of these six, these six uh, volumes, that you mentioned, if you had to recommend one out of the six, which one would you recommend? It's difficult because it's all linked so, to each uh, other. Eh? You want easy questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. I, I, I think I would have to recommend the two last ones because you the cannot you cannot understand the last one without having read the before last ones. Well, mm. but still, the last one is the ethics and humanity of humanity. Yes, that's right. For me, it, uh, there's a lot of talk about complexity, and then he, <clears throat> when he makes the distinction between low and high he falls back on a simple dichotomy that I find mm -hmm. rather <laughs> astonishing because when I hear you, where you gave all the elements of uh, low and high uh, complexity, when you see all the elements of the low complexity, I was thinking of China and <laughs> they would not be very pleased. No, I don't and think so. Then, of course, the West would be the high complexity system. Well, I don't think I'm that, a little bit. I think don't think Morin would agree that the West is in a high uh, complex uh, situation because he already thinks that our basic paradigm is completely wrong and that the way we do science, uh, we will never understand anything. So we still are in uh, low complexity. Okay. Yeah. And it's also it. I had to search through the 2,500 pages to try and figure out what was the uh, what he actually said about complexity, and this comes from the first book, so maybe he evolved over time. Well, the definition of complexity that I usually give is not so much complexity as a static property, but complexity growth, complexification, which I define as differentiation and integration. So differentiation means that you have lots of diverse components that are all different and integration is that they are more and more dependent on each other so the aspect that you spoke about like lots of interactions would fit in there mm -hmm. i think this kind of definition probably would fit his world but i don't know whether he has considered that in terms of differentiation and integration well i probably I he will have considered it but i think he didn't want to restrict himself to giving a definition that he wants it to be as broad as possible because complexity is very broad, obviously. I have a question about what's what the title, the method, what does it refer to? Is it like the method of like of what or for what? I think it means the method to think. Uh -huh. How how do we need to think? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's inspired by the cards whose famous yes. book was called La Methode, and the work of Moa is also called La Methode. But the difference is that the method of the card is analysis, splitting up all the method mm -hmm. of, of Moa is precisely connecting everything instead of splitting it up. So it's a com competing method. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think yeah. it's meant to be an mm -hmm. alternative that he wants to be the, the card for the modern age. Well, 
Dat heb ik gezegd. Ah, ik is ook wat de bedoeling van de from the from the title, ja. Yeah? Oh, I, uh, made by the person who made Principia Cybernetica. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, 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 not just from the title I had, just from the comment too. And that's kind of what I remember from it. That's part of what I had. It. It's so long ago. Mm -hmm. it's, uh... Yes, because it is also, uh, 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 I didn't talk about it, but he analyzes also the Cogitor Resum from, from Descartes. And to, well, he claims it's completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So, are there any further questions? Do we have questions from anybody on Zoom? Maybe. Or comments? Uh, Herat. Sorry, unmute myself. <clears throat> I wonder about uh, in the beginning of your um, summary, you referred to the tension between uh, let us say the generative and the disorderly uh, forces, um, which uh, eventually uh, sum is summarized in the notion of life. Uh, what kind of um, knowledge, what is the form of the knowledge that is required to describe this process of uh, tension between different forces? According to Moran. I think it's the di dialogic. But that's not a form of knowledge in principle, unless you say it is. I mean, then I accept it, of course. I think for Moran, there is nothing such as uh, absolute knowledge. So it will uh, always be a sub so. To him, there will always be a dialogic because to speak, because there is it, there are always antagonisms in uh, any knowledge. But <clears throat> that is in in itself is a description of the precise process that you describe. So, for example, you mentioned that in order to act, you need a purpose and means, and I wonder. Um, how purpose and means actually lead to antagonisms? Because we are in, in we are interreacting with other uh, entities, which also okay. have purposes and means. Okay, so that means that uh, this process of um, process of <coughs> change is not described by the usual form of knowledge um, as, for example, uh, what is considered a hypothesis? No. Okay. Anything else than a hypothesis? No, I don't. I think he, he has been writing everything down the way he taught it. It's sometimes ah. so. He's not starting from a specific hypothesis. He's starting more from uh, a feeling that there is something fundamental wrong, fundamentally wrong. Okay. Can I ask another question, or is there no time? Yes, of course. Um, in a complex society, apparently complex society is close to a chaotic society. Yes, he says that the more complex uh, uh, something becomes, the more prone it is to become to becoming chaotic. But in itself, that is not entirely logical because... But that's one uh, of the questions I was going to put up because I have already been thinking about it too. Uh, and I have to read so maybe we can just do it all together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, another more general question. I remember from the first book that I had that it was mostly referring to people that we would call the cybernetics and systems tradition, like from the first uh, from Belta Landfi, von Neumann, uh, Ashby, uh, uh, Maturana. In the later volumes, does he still refer yeah. to these? It's less and less. 
Uh -huh. It's also why I think it's more and more pamphleteering because he's work, he's continuing to work on his own way of thinking and referring less and less to other people. Uh, so, and, and then he becomes really, especially in the last book, very pamphleteering that you're like, okay. <laughs> But but then you say those books are the, the ones. Yes, because it's, it's it's <laughs> I think it's books two, three, and four. He is repeating so many times what he's been writing in book one and adding so little uh -huh. that you just get bored in the end. I, uh -huh. I sometimes I was playing games <laughs> because I couldn't I would fall fall asleep uh, <laughs> because. It was the fifth or the sixth time he was uh, explaining the same thing and then you still are afraid scene. that you are going to miss something new he's going to introduce <laughs> so this is just if you can mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the kind of problem that i would tell my students what happens if you don't make an outline of what you're going to say before you say it and to repeat yourself yeah, but it's also because it's been written in such a long period of time. If, if, if there is five or six years in between one volume and the next, probably... I, well, you could summarize the previous yes. volume, chapter one, and then that's the new thing that's instead of reading yeah, that's everything. True. But it's still remarkable, you know, like there are plenty of people who write 15 pages and nobody reads those pages, and there are people who write 2,000 and a half, and people <laughs> complain, but keep reading. <laughs> so. Well, I, I, as I said, I read the first volume, which was already pretty long, like four or 500 oh. pages in 1979 or something like that, and I did read it until the end. It was interesting. He has some tricks. So shall we pass on to my questions then? <laughs> so I have, uh, I've all, through the whole book, I have been thinking about this recursive loop because I mean, I think I'm, I'm wondering whether it avoids of being a vicious circle, even though he said that one element influences the other. Uh, I was also one, wondering whether we can compare it with bootstrapping. And then there is something very peculiar in the first volume. It's simply a loop. So that's for me a vicious circle. And in the final part of that same volume, he speaks about a spiral. And then uh, I was wondering uh, whether it shouldn't be a combination of both. Uh, and the notion of a recursive loop is only introduced in volume five. And I made a drawing of what I thought it should be looking like. Mm -hmm. Because you always, with the recursive loop, you also have a problem that to me it seems very uh, linear and that you uh, you don't allow for bifurcations, which here you could have, and then making it, that, that looks more like com complexity, I think. So do, did you think uh, that the bootstrapping is what he was referring to? I've read the books too long ago, but I mean, the way I understand loops in cybernetics, of course, the whole idea of cybernetics was the idea of the loop. It was originally, it wasn't called cybernetic, it was called circular mechanisms or circular processes. And it's all the idea of the loop, but there are, of course, many different loops. There are the simple loops, there are the feedback loops, there are the negative feedback, there are the positive feedback, there are the bootstrappings. There are the recursions, there is quite a lot of variety in loops, but what the loop has, it's an interesting way to get going. You mean, as you say, by bootstrapping, that means you start from yourself and then you go yourself out of yourself. And so I think that indeed the, the concept of bootstrapping is for me the most interesting one, but it's not well defined. But usually what I do as I define bootstrapping is you use A, to somehow develop B, and then you use B to develop A, and then you to, into A, A prime, and then you use A prime to develop B prime, and like that you go up and down, and you go up, but each time you have more and more. So the bootstrapping is like building yourself up by having one part interact with the other part, and that is the loop. Mm -hmm. It's, it seems to me that you know, I, I wouldn't equate, you know, like lo recursive loop with what you say, vicious circle, because it's, uh, yeah, the vi vicious is just, uh, you know, like 
maybe not just, but it's already an evaluation of do we like the system or not? <laughs> because yeah. like in, in the like heuristics of systems thinking, like basically the game, the epistemic game is to identify loops, yes? And then you say, I see a system and I see how it gets going, yes? So you identify basically this. You identify how this leads to this, this leads to this, this leads to this, and this is how this and system goes. And how do goes, you, yeah? how do the different loops inter 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 interact? So you know, like you either either identify them as a, as a part of your system or as interactive entities, yes, with your system and so on. So, uh, but it's it's a heuristic, yes, it's like a way of mapping. So basically, you you have a sense of accomplishment as a system thinker when everything is looping. Yes? So once it is okay, fine, I, I, I'm 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 done. Yes? So uh, and and then the the name vicious would be ah, we don't want this loop to loop. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> no, but mm -hmm. uh, in Dutch, vicious circle is one which just turns around. Or, uh, it, I didn't have a thing in like in English, vicious in English means that yeah. it's something. Uh, but in uh, English, you have this vicarious cycle that you will say exactly the opposite that you want to have a positive reinforcement loop, and then you call, call it vicarious. Yeah? But it's uh, it just so, uh, like. Uh, I, I would say that the vicious loop is a positive feedback where it's amplifying something you don't want. Like yeah. poverty leads to more poverty, yeah. illness leads to more illness than the vicious yeah. loop. Yeah. So right, like right. But if it is uh -huh. uh, uh, wealth leading to more wealth, then it's not <laughs> vicious, but it's still the same positive feedback. Yes, exactly. So it's, so it's an evaluation. If yeah. yeah. oh. resources are limited, so if wealth becomes more, so somebody becomes poor. So. And here it comes, you know, like the relativity but, of the <laughs> vision. <laughs> but, but I want to make a, a, just a mm -hmm. distinction about the loop seal that it is used in two different, quite different uh, connotations. When you speak about recursiveness, I think it, this is uh, like deriving from uh, the mathematical uh, the mathematical terminology where you you uh, you have a variable you apply a function to this variable and the outcome of the function you re, uh, reinsert into the function mm -hmm. and this is what is called recursiveness while uh, cybernetics cybernetic loops involve a certain uh, 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 flow of energy that or even even uh, even more abstractly when something is causing uh, when a is causing b is causing c but c has already a causative effect on a mm -hmm. so and this uh, usually involves involves a, a movement of matter or energy within a physical system while recursiveness can be, can be purely purely yeah. mathematical and not necessarily mean uh, that uh, at least in the first understanding that means like uh, moving matter or energy. Mm -hmm. No, but in cybernetics usually interpreted in terms of information there may be a material loop, but the feedback gives you information about what was initially there. And then building on that information, you can generate more information, and then you get into the yeah, recursiveness is, or in the bootstrap. And this is already a more complex uh, mm -hmm. construction that involves recursion and cybernetical uh, feedback. So uh, cause and effect, what is called cause and effect loops that uh, are... Uh, and then, then again also the idea of loop is a simplification because if we speak about uh, more complex systems we speak about uh, more uh, networks of mm -hmm. networks of processes that are interacting and every interaction actually as if we if we call it interaction it's already involving a certain uh, reciprocal reciprocal activity and therefore it is uh, every interaction is already a cybernetic uh, activity that you may call a loop but if we consider many such things it's not anymore like uh, uh, gives this uh, the metaphor of of a cycle is already completely gone 
it's not it's not gun it's too simple yeah. it's not simple to show what's what's going on really well i want to give two examples that are more recent kind of formalisms to capture it there's no in cognition uh, this predictive processing framework which says that the traditional view of cognition is bottom up you get incoming information in your in your eyes for example and then your brain step by step interprets that information and comes finally with an abstract concept so from concrete stimuli to abstract concept well the predictive processing framework says there is a feedback the moment you start recognizing some kind of a pattern in it at a higher level that pattern is sent back to the lower level to fill in the details that are missing in what you perceive and if we can perceive something typically we don't have enough information as yet to decide what it is but by doing this kind of a looping that from the parts we already have we start inducing some pattern which then we send back to the incoming information to fill it in like that we typically by looping a couple of times up down you get a well supported interpretation so that is one example where you have a kind of a bootstrapping but here the bootstrapping has an end point in the sense that you see something ambiguous initially there may be a couple of up and down movement in your brain to say what it is and then you come to a conclusion but more interesting would be if you have a kind of a looping that doesn't end that continues mm -hmm. and a good example i think of is a dialogue i have two people with different backgrounds different interpretations mm -hmm. and the one proposes something and then the other says yeah what you say may be interesting but you forget about this and this and i don't agree with that and that and then you say well you don't agree with it because you haven't understood what i meant by this and like that there's a back and forth and hopefully together they like that they build up a better understanding and either of them would have gotten and that's a process that can go on and go on so i think that's a good example when people that also ties into the problem of emergence like the classical reduction is trying to say well emergence doesn't exist you have two things you put them together they are still the same two things but if you think in terms of these interactions where the one in a sense dialogues with the other, you can't say what will come out of the dialogue. It's like saying, I put two people with different backgrounds and opinions together in a room, I let them discuss. I already know what, what they will agree. No, you can't because they have never met, they have different opinions. You can't predict what will come out of it. And that's what emergence is. They have different things that start interacting. They have never interacted before can't know what will come out of that interaction the emergence is really that this bootstrapping of different parts looping the one into the other something comes out that you can't predict and that is novel mm -hmm. can i ask something about the first uh, line just a recursive loop avoid being a vicious circle it suggests that you take the two as extremely different. Wouldn't it be possible that a vicious circle is a special kind of recursive loop? Yes, that would be possible also. <laughs> okay. So it's not something to be avoided, but it's something that may happen and then you may treat it if you don't like it. Yes, but my question was, uh, is it not a vicious circle and only that? Well, that's the difficulty, presumably, of language. <laughs> so then we come to the question you were asking. So I was wondering whether uh, complexity can be uh, destructive. And, yes. Uh, 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 so Morin states that extreme, extreme complexity leads to disorder but uh, a system can be more or less than the sum of its parts so why should it always lead to disorder or be destructive how does that relate to entropy and what do we do with emergence because emergence could also avoid complexity to be destructive or to lead to disorder yes i, I think they are good questions 
one of them, um, <clears throat> one of the things that apparently Moran said is that extreme complexity implies resilience. If a complex system is resilient, then it can obviously avi avoid, um, well, first of all, it can create uh, emergent, but it can also avoid disorder. I mean, okay. like an immune system helps you to avoid disorder. Uh, well, the further I read, uh, the fur more I found that he became a little bit pessimistic. So ah. I had the... <laughs> <laughs> I had the impression that he was, especially in the last book, I had the impression that he was convinced that we would not be able to avoid uh, disorder uh, and uh, um, the, 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 because of the destructiveness of what we are doing as humans. Uh. We don't manage to... Uh, to, to, to have something emerge, he is asking for a metamorphosis, uh, to have something emerge which would be uh, integrating the complexity instead of uh, 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 reducing it and allowing humans to uh, develop what he would call a high complex society. So I. It, he was just saying that he didn't think we would manage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you mean here complexity in the human sphere, not just complexity. In no, not in, no, I mean, it, no, in the, we see all spectrum of complexity in the universe. No, no, I was thinking about uh, what Morin wrote and at the end he, he's really getting pretty pessimistic about whether we are going to be able to metamorphose. He even doesn't think we can civilize. If I may say something about it, I don't mean that complexity is destructive, but there is a, in a, in the relationship between human individuals and, and greater bodies like social bodies, a, there is a tendency of human organizations to to reach a state where there are a lot of complex co uh, components that are being organized by something which is much more simplistic than the complexity of the component. So for example, if you take uh, like the governance of, uh, of a state, a, a, a nation state, the, the nation state is made of individuals and also organization of individuals, but the individuals are pretty much diverse and, uh, and complex. Well, in order to govern and organize the whole this uh, population into something that works according to some, uh, usually a mechanistic, a, me a, me a kind of a mechanistic uh, paradigm, you need to simplify and you simplify and you simplify. So you get into, into a situation where a, a population of intelligent uh, agents or entities are being governed and organized by something which is by a, that compared to the elements is much more simple. And this, I believe, can be destructive. Yeah. So in a, in, and now when we compare, uh, this is very simplistic what I'm going to say, but when we uh, when we compare a uh, totalitarian regime without mentioning names and the uh, democratic re re other regimes that without mentioning names because sometimes certain, certain regimes uh, pose as democratic way not and, uh, and uh, vice versa. But if we compare it, what is the difference between them? Is it the democratic uh, system is still a mechanistic, is still a mechanistic model, but it allows more diversity and more complexity uh, compared to the other option. So I think that in this sense, if not complexity is, uh, is what uh, destructive, but the other way around, when we uh, when we want to confine and restrict and oversimplify the actual uh, reality of living together as human beings, and we try to 
to solve it as a problem, to take it to take it as a problem and solve it by putting restriction, putting constraints, and limiting the creativity of the system to produce the, to produce uh, new problems and new solutions. Yes. And, but I think I have the answer to my question. I think that actually what the answer should be is that it's not complexity which can be destructive, but it's the way humans uh, act within uh, complexity which can be destructive. Yeah, because they afraid of people are afraid of complexity. They want to simplify. No, what, what we will say, I think it's a typical application of uh, Ashby's law of requisite variety, typically the problem with totalitarian systems is that the system that is controlling is much simpler than the thing it is trying to control. Mm -hmm. It does not have enough variety. Well, the advantage of democracy is that if there's not enough variety, new people with new ideas will come up and they will add the variety. You can always, like, for example, now in Holland, suddenly there was a new party that became the biggest party at all. That is a mechanism where obviously there was a problem with the existing variety didn't address well, and then a new variety is created. While in a totalitarian system, that doesn't work. And then, in terms of complexity in general, in my definition of complexity, which is integration and differentiation, the two to keep each other in balance, the differentiation is more kind of a disorderly force, the integration is more kind of an orderly force. But because the one goes together with the other, you have complexity and it is not destructive because the one balances the other and they balance not only they balance each other, they generate each other. In society, the differentiation, you might say, is like the division of labor. People have ever more diverse jobs and ever more diverse backgrounds and ever more diverse things they study or they do, or different diverse types of businesses. So differentiation, more, more, more disorder. But on the other hand, all these very diverse people and very diverse firms doing very diverse things, they're all integrated because there are things like markets and communication so that even if you need some very niche product, let's say I invent something, some stones that have uh, that have use in certain Buddhist rituals where you put a stone on your head in order to meditate, well, there will probably be a very, very small market for these special kind of stones. But suppose that you are some person who is interested in those rituals. Probably by the internet, you will find that there is some firm somewhere in Korea that produces these stones and you can order them. The system is integrated. So the integration means that the different parts, however diverse, however far apart, however varied, are connected and they can interact in a synergetic way. So integration for me means synergetic interactions. There is the ability of the diverse parts to work together in such a way that they all profit from it. That's one possibility. It can also work in other ways. Because interdependence can also stimulate conflict. It can, but it doesn't have to. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, but uh, uh, my, my my general principle of how I see self-organizing evolution is you have different agents. Each agent has its own things it wants, its own things it can do. So often if you put two agents together, they're in conflict because the one wants to take the thing that the other one wants or they want opposite things. What happens then is that the agents will try to find different configurations where either they can avoid the conflict or the competition, or they find some other agent, or they find a new way of acting so they are no longer in conflict. They can annihilate each other. They can annihilate each other, yes. But generally speaking, the evolution is if the interaction is conflictual, the interaction is kind of so destructive. So destructive. In, like you say, in the worst case, they annihilate each other, but some of the structure also in the sense that they decide at a certain moment we'll avoid each other, or we will find some new way of interacting. Conflictual interactions for me are self-negating, they self-destruct after a while. Therefore, 
my optimistic view yeah, is that the conflict is not lost, of course, in the worst case, the conflict means that everybody destroys each other, that it's theoretically possible, but it's usually not the outcome. But actually, I very much like what Hot is brought from, like in, in one of the first slides about the value of conflict as well. Yes, and the, like it was like directly linked in your uh, in in the like what you were saying with growth of intelligence. Yes, that it's you know like just com like two competing understandings. You know like paradigms, uh, loops, whatever. Yes, this this is where, where they kind of press on each other. This is where you know like. Things come into being, so you know, like if, if like uh, we we have the stability conflict, bad agreement is good, but you know, like any like isn't any new, how like also produced by like just simply that they are not the same and they don't just simply harmonize, and this is why this this energy for for emergence well, is also created. As I say, the conflict is so destructive. It also means the conflict. Is generating something else. Yeah. The conflictual relationship doesn't stay as such, it turns into something, into something else. New, yeah. And typically, it's because of the conflict that something new is created. Yeah, yeah, because you, you said that it was different than in Hegel. What, what, uh, what uh, it co continues because, to exist. Yeah, because, uh, that it and it's not like, resolved at a very higher synthesis. Some, like, that it's like, it's okay, the okay, science about the dialogic. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you call the integration? Uh, integration and uh, dissolution and to differentiation you basically you basically mean it as a spontaneous activity within the system that is something which is imposed mm -hmm. so, and so because I think this is like the roof of these two differentiation and integration is what you can say for valuation which is not basically imposed by an idea or what was in one of the slides, the paradigm that tells you, okay, this is the wanted state of affairs, and therefore we need to, if we know what is this state of affairs, we need to divide how to reach there, and therefore there are certain activities that we need to do just to differentiate this and integrate this, and all this becomes a kind of a paradigmatic order walking towards a certain uh, a certain outcome, which is of course uh, doomed from the beginning. While in this uh, in the idea of integration and differentiation, which are, which are both partake of what I call individuation, it is not something which is. Uh, paradigmatically imposed, it is really the, uh, if I may say, the natural unfoldment uh, of a system of a system of interacting interacting entities, interacting agents, but not necessarily even agents. Like, so it happens there. Yes, it, uh, and sometimes it creates something which is stable for a while, persistent, that can partake in higher and higher levels of, uh, of organization. And sometimes, no, it's like, it's the disintegration, the dissolution, the differentiation, which might be destructive or not. Yes, dissociation can be uh, considered as destructive, but also as creative. Yes, if, if I find a new distinction, that supports new understanding or insight, it's, it's not destructive at all, yes, it provides more understanding. Yeah, it's also, also again, like with this vicious and vicarious, you know, like destructive or creative, just, you know, like already an, an evaluation of, uh, it's already a value statement, yes, but structurally differentiation or disagreement is the same, yes. In, uh, Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a part of the dynamic that I didn't sketch I said if you start with differentiation there is a tendency to come to integration but integration also fosters differentiation in the sense that if you live in a world integrated society like ours I wouldn't say is but used to be maybe 
you have the freedom to differentiate because the, the system provides you with the possibilities. If you have to survive, then you should stick to the things you know. You should try to get the things that are there. You don't have the ability to tie out, to do trial and errors. When there is integration, you are in a safer environment, and then you can afford to differentiate. And that's what you see in society. The division of labor becomes larger, the richer the society is. If you are in a society where everybody are subsistence farmers, there's very little uh, space for differentiation. Or if the uh, society is sufficiently efficiently organized, that there's enough food for everybody, you can have people starting to do things that have nothing to do with agriculture, and then you get this whole differentiation that we have now. So you differentiate between one another, but also kind of internally, yeah? So like you, you used to be in a certain way and now you think, ah, oh, I don't like it anymore. And parts of you keeps doing that and parts of you already want something different. So it's also kind of like a well, there is a kind of an internal dynamic if only because of random movements, there are always random things happening in the universe, like genetic mutations, they happen randomly. Why do species differentiate? Because from time to time there's a mutation in the one that doesn't happen in the other. And if this mutation is sufficiently successful, it may find a new niche and then develop, and then you have differentiation splitting up into species. The same happens in society. If somebody has some new idea for whatever reason, maybe purely random, maybe he had some dream or something, and he starts a new business, then differentiation. Yeah. Differentiation is something that in a sense happens spontaneously that the environment should allow it. And so what you ask also the question, emergence, emergence is precisely this process that you have a number of agents that become differentiated and then they find a way to synergetically interact. So there is integration. That integration now creates a system with emergent properties. Mm. We couldn't have predicted that from the beginning. There was still one slide with mm -hmm. questions. Yes, I was wondering whether we, Dr. Moria, was working towards uh, analogy. So, uh, analogy is the one as the first cause of our all being. Um, uh, and I think that uh, he thinks that the multiple, which he considers as uh, a multidimensionality, which co -de determines the object of knowledge, could be considered as the one, uh, because all the modes of unification are also included. So you have one big whole. So that's the one. And then is that uh, he uh, refers also to un unitas multiplex, uh, where he wants to associate uh, the one and the multiple. He puts focus on relinking, where he thinks that that's the basic of ethics and that ethics is relinking. So is that because relinking you are making a whole again and he's also putting emphasis on solidarity so i was wondering and he's also talking about that all nations should come together in one big uh, world uh, society uh, so he's really looking at unification somehow um and uh so does he want to want if this is complexity Invites us to invite us to research on the totality as the one. So uh, I was wondering whether it's a philosophical approach which surpasses cosmology. What, 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 what is the difference between this and the interconnectedness of all things? It's a philosophical term. It's the one as the first cause of all, all being. So is this term or did that exist before? Because the analogy that uh, exists, yes, it's a philosophical term. I didn't know because I, I just know the term henotheism, which is something like a, a precursor of monotheism, where you assume that one god is the most important one for you, but you don't deny that there are other gods. What's so it's at the same level as uh, uh, ontology, uh, epistemology, ethic, ethics. It's but it's never really developed in uh, philosophy because it comes from the one as being God, of course, uh, mm -hmm. and it's very uh, 
well, medieval <laughs> or even earlier. Uh, so, but I mean, it, you could also uh, interpret henology uh, as something different, as that the whole is is the cause of all, of everything, uh, and that's what I think he's doing. It is a very interesting concept, and uh, I will speak about something that has been inspiring me a lot recently. Uh, you will probably hear that name more than once here in Clea, the name of Raphael Rigogier, who was a who is a French philosopher who was also at the same conference where Edgar Morin was. Uh, but he's, all, he's also a sociologist. He's not so much a philosopher of complexity, but a sociologist of the religious in the white sense. And his theory is that we actually do have a global religion at the moment. And it's what he calls individual globalism. It's the idea that by developing ourselves, we open up to the totality, to the global, to the world. And it's he gives lots of examples. It's kind of very most explicit in all kind of new age thinking of self-development and self-transcendence. So both the idea developing yourself internally and by that way opening up to the rest of the world and doing uh, getting as many experiences as possible, traveling, meeting other cultures, getting in touch with, with different paradigms. This combination of developing the self while connecting to the totality, for him, that is the religion of the Today. moment, which is implicit in, 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 in our thinking. And I think it's, it's, a very, it's, it's, a, it, it's very relevant. I think we are all, all implicitly thinking in that way. And what you are saying there, Moa, is obviously also thinking in that way. In, in more traditional views, God is something that they're different from you. There is you and there is God. And those two, they are only indirectly connected. Well, this new view is I am myself by the fact that I'm open up to the totality. So there is this, this, this immediate connection between the self and the whole. Mm -hmm. And the whole goes through the self and the self goes through the whole. I think that this, that's indeed, it's, it's, it's and what he also notices, what he also said is the older cosmologists, like the ancient Greeks and the medieval, there the cosmos is something close, it's finite. There is the earth, and then there is the sphere of the stars, and it's one sphere within the other sphere, but it's closed. Well, now our worldview is the world is infinite, the universe is infinite. There are stars beyond stars and galaxies beyond galaxies. But it's it's completely different. It's a completely different worldview. But you know, Francis, if you continue in, in this vein, in your reasoning right now, and you end up with the statement that you are the incarnation of this God on Earth, you know, because this is like the natural, the natural conclusion of what you are saying, like incarnation, yeah. No, not that, the like the old soul, you know, and you can you can use the metaphor of being the sun, you know, and you you, you know how it works. <laughs> Because it's like it, it's like exactly this perception, yes. Then it's put in words, and then they say, "I am, I am this, you know, like this child no, of no, God," no, and no, then no. they put you on cross. And... No, 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 no. It, it's more <laughs> like in the the more Buddhistic and Hinduistic notions that uh, by meditating you kind of feel that you merge and you become part of the whole. Like you, you try to get rid of this. Illusion, they call it that there is you and then there is the world, mm -hmm. and that there's two are separate, yeah. the kind of merging they, in the whole, yeah, but it's merging out, but also yeah. you know, like it's more, you know, like made out of this whole thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, this is what I mean, like yeah. incarnation, yeah. 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 how did you come to be? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a kind of a religious view, mm -hmm. which I think is implicit in lots of yeah. modern ideology, but which is actually very different from the medieval and antique yeah. ones. And I think we're also all working on that with this work on, on, yeah. on, on, on complexity, because complexity is yeah. clearly something infinite, yeah. and we are part of it, and there is this interconnection always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because complexity, mm -hmm. if, you, if you try to cultivate a view, a, a complex view of, of a spiritual way of thinking, or that's even not religious, you see, that uh, 
There are two, there, there are two very discernible paradigms about the spiritual development of the mind of the human. One of them is a focus to center around the idea of eternity, of wholeness, of being the whole universe for all time, like extending our locality in space time into all and everything. And the second one is just the opposite. What is important is the moment, just now, this location at this moment, and nothing else exists. And these are, and, and now, if you introduce, uh, and if you like uh, monotheistic religions, uh, mostly Christianity, but not, uh, but not only are those that work on uh, eternity because they want you the next life and uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. While uh, just to give one uh, one example of uh, like uh, Japanese Japanese uh, uh, Zen, going the other way around. It's it's the moment. It's the experience of the moment, and there is nothing else. Now, if we introduce complexity into it, uh, we understand that these are only two extreme cases of something which might be more interesting, more creative, and more diverse in its modality in its possibilities, etc. Even you might create all sorts of combinations between the two. But but I think that what what uh, what complexity or the idea of complexity is contributing to this spiritual way of of uh, thinking is that uh, it makes it a problem. A problem not in the negative sense, like a problem is a riddle to be solved in our life. Yes. <clears throat> and so I don't, I, I, I'm not sure that I, I was following this uh, philosopher, the, the sociologist that you were mentioning, because, yeah. yes, because I, I suddenly had the impression that he's trying to sell me a like uh, quantity turned into quality somehow, because if I accumulate more and more diverse experiences, I become more connected to the universe. No, I don't believe it really. It's like, it's, this is like a commercialization of something. Or, well, and he described it as uh, yeah, very commercially as all this kind of yeah, <laughs> things, but he says it's the implicit religion of this age. And I think even, us, I think we are much less naive than all those new age things. I think we are looking at this relationship between the individual and the whole the world. Your concept of apostle, after all, is a view of the world, but it isn't just the world, it is us in the world. Mm -hmm. What is my role within that big world? It's a connection between the individual and the world. And the, the, the book, the book that I'm reading, it's called uh, Souci de Soi. Conscience du monde, that means care for yourself, consciousness of the whole, of the world. And it's for him, the religion of the moment is this constant inter, this deep setting between the two, opening up to the whole and developing yourself by opening up to the world and opening up to the world by developing yourself. Mm -hmm. He sees it as, as, as the two sides of the same coin. What is what annoys the Russians for uh, the most? <laughs> what do you mean that's how? <laughs> yeah, I think the Russians are very still in the old uh, in the old system where there is like it's not that old if you read uh, like Alexander Dugin is like also a sociologist a philosopher and said ah, all this individualism is so against natural law that yeah, yeah, and suddenly you have an idea to be, ah, you were born a man or a woman, suddenly you have an idea of sexual preference, of being of this gender or that gender, what, does, what, what is this bullshit? There is an order in nature. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, when, when yeah. he writes about it, it's sophisticated and very well argued, yes? It's not like uh, you can dismiss it. From all the all the best uh, philosophers, you know, and also like presented. I read it. I read his book. Uh, yeah, also, yes, 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 yeah, also yeah, presented yeah. as an innovation. So it's not like going back to anything. It's not like next. Like exactly, it's an operation of innovating a world. So communist didn't work. Fascist didn't work. In American uh, individualism. 
evil yeah so like okay so what do we like what do we, we come up and this fourth paradigm that he's presenting exactly this which will be like I have a diatonic, but I have the impression that the false paradigm is a rationalization of the old traditional style and all your consciousness and the civilization, you are grouping into the virtual world and you just should know your place it's, in there. It's basically, you know, like what, what, okay, but it's, it's really like even in the description is closer to communism was faulty and fascism was faulty, but not as bad as individualism. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Of those Actually, in our opinion, we're going to be able to invite him to give a seminar. Yeah. It's very reactionary, actually. <laughs> I think you will agree. Because his, his primary, he, he, he understands that his primary mistake is attribution uh, of kind of importance to individuals, yeah? So because the humanity and he's taking even from you, you know, this collective thing. Yeah, so, so, I mean, so this there's this, so the arguments yeah. yeah, complex like it's it's like the, the all the like component language is really I mean, I mean this, 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 this global illusion that your day is describing, uh -huh. he's describing it as an outsider. He's not saying that is the way it is, yeah. but if you see it is actually the, the implicit illusion of let's say most intellectuals in most of the of the, of the liberal parts of the world mm -hmm. uh, in Russia, clearly yeah. it's not. Yeah, you know, in but China, I suppose some people will have it, some people will not. Very few. Yeah, yeah very few probably. I, I think that this is uh, this is like an interesting, uh, like identifying the way of thinking, which again I believe that it is like avoiding digging into your own soul by simplifying, by creating a kind of a simplified uh, uh, framework of working. Okay, now, and I, I think that what is, uh, what is the strongest point, if, if I understand what you are uh, uh, talking about, the strongest, the strongest point of this, of this direction is it gives you a bridge between a certain uh, maybe longing of a spiritual a spiritual uh, searching for spiritual purpose and making building a bridge into something which is actionable. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. now instead of going to the church or going to the mosque or the synagogue or where, or, or to the temple, now you go and accumulate all sorts of experiences, meet things, etc. So, and by then you fulfill the purpose. Mm -hmm. You fulfill the the spiritual uh, like okay, giving an answer yes, and in in and identifying this the uh, idea of giving an answer. This is, was always like one of the primary functions of uh, of organized religion yeah. is to give you an answer. But let's stay with the question. No, this is very difficult. Well, in this case, makes us unhappy. No, no, but in this case, it's, it's not an answer, it's a speaking, it's no. something that will never be finished. So he is more like describing no, the process yeah. of what, what, how people behave with yeah. this. And, yeah. and, 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 and he also uses the concept of uh, what he calls hyper nature, hyper tradition, and hyper science that means exaggerated. We are going back to the traditions of the shamans and the aboriginals, and it should be as traditional as traditional, but in the end, it has nothing to do with what the real shamans were doing. And you know, we go to hyper science, it's not just yeah. the traditional science. No, we want transhumanism, we want mind uploading, we want genetic manipulation, and then uh, so hyper tradition, hyper culture, and hyper nature. We want the real, original, wild nature, not the nature the way people have made it, but the nature before people want it. We want to be as natural as possible. And so these are the three things that typically this kind of global religion he describes are looking uh -huh. for. Like it must be scientific, and it must be natural, and it must be traditional, but hyper natural, hyper traditional, and hyper scientific. And, altogether, yeah. and if you look at what we are doing, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a very good description of what, what all of us are somehow busy with yeah. in a naive way. If you look at some new age yeah. uh, catalog, 
uh, where they will show you how by rebirthing you will come in contact with your inner child and whatever. These are the naive versions of what we are doing are the most sophisticated. It's actually the same. Okay. I think we are finished. And is there any of the questions? So do you want to keep like a closing statement or not so much? No, no let's go to opinion. <laughs> okay, that was the statement I was I was looking for. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Closing statement we needed here. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's the that's that's the formula. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> Oh, we can go linking there. Yes. The real linking is in one of these new age types of the world. Yeah, I am not clear what's the difference between linking and real linking. <laughs> <laughs>